Thank you. G good afternoon uh, to those of you that are in the West, uh, maybe mountain time, central time. And for those of you that are on the East Coast or Eastern time, good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Armando Contreras. I'm the president and CEO of United Cerebral Palsy National, a network of 57 affiliates in the US and Canada, providing quality and vital services to children, teens, adults with cerebral palsy and various disabilities. It is my pleasure to take a time to welcome you to the fifth webinar since the start of the UCP Professional Learning Series, which is hosted by UCP's Research Committee and our other partners, Gillette Children's and UCP of Minnesota, including UCP of Central Arizona. This presentation also marks the one year anniversary since the start of the series, which has seen its audience grow steadily over the past year. Today, more than 150 individuals have registered, which includes not only practitioners in the field, many from our affiliates, but also self-advocates, family members, and the general public. The focus of these presentations and of the U UCP Research Committee is early intervention. I should mention here that the Research Committee, among its many activities, is currently administering a pilot program, a grant program, for research in cerebral palsy and related neurodevelopmental disorders. The application deadline is June 27th, so let me repeat that again. The grant application deadline is June 27th, and for details, go to our website at ucp.org. That's ucp.org and check under the research tab on our main menu. Please note that UCP affiliates are strongly encouraged to apply. Now on to the business at hand. For that, I will turn it over to our colleague, Tara Swedberg of Gillette's Children's, who will introduce today's presenter. Tara, the floor is yours. Thanks, Armando. I'm going to just throw up the welcome slide here again. So everyone, just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and will be available to watch um, in the near future on the UCP Nationals website. We will not be taking questions during the presentation, but you are welcome to drop questions into the chat icon, which can be found at the top of your screen. And Dr. Gormley will join us for a live Q&A um, when the recording is done. Mark Gormley Jr., MD, is a pediatric rehabilitation medicine physician at Gillette Children's. He treats children and adolescents who have cerebral palsy, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, neuromuscular disorders, and other conditions with a special interest in spasticity management. He joined Gillette in 1993. Dr. Gormley received his medical degree at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Louisville, Kentucky. He completed his residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Tufts Affiliated Hospitals in Boston and completed a fellowship in pediatric rehabilitation medicine and traumatic brain injury at the University of Michigan Medical Center. Dr. Gormley is board certified in pediatric physical medicine and rehabilitation. His professional memberships include the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, the Association of Academic Physiatrists, and the Association of Children's Prosthetics Orthotic Clinics. Dr. Gormley is on the UCP Board of Trustees and is the board liaison for the UCP Research Committee. I'm Mark Gormley. I'm a, a pediatric uh, physiatrist at Gillette Children's in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm going to be talking about the management of difficult clinical presentations and hypertonia in children with disabilities. And so uh, what I want to do is just, I'm going to uh, start off with some basic uh, pathophysiology of some of the kids that we see with neurologic problems. I'm going to uh, present some of the treatments that we have. And then at the end, I'll, I'll talk about some of the uh, difficult clinical uh, presentations that we have and uh, show you uh, some of the before and afters and uh, uh, let you make a decision about uh, uh, how that worked out. And sometimes we think we do the right things, sometimes they don't end up uh, exactly like we were hoping. So uh, in disclosure, uh, I do uh, have uh, contracts with Allergan and Ibsen for speaker bureaus and for consultation. Uh, I'm going to try not to be biased during this talk, but just to let you know that uh, uh, I do work with them. Uh, they're the makers of uh, Botox and Dysport, which are botulinum toxins. 
So I'm going to do basically an overview of cerebral palsy. Now, most people know what cerebral palsy is, but they, it has four uh, specific uh, elements for its definition. Uh, you need a, a child that has a, a brain injury. So the first one is, is a brain, some type of brain injury. That brain injury needs to be static, not a progressive neurologic disorder, but the, whatever damage has been done is over and done with. Uh, it has to be a pediatric onset. Now, the usual definition is less than two years of age. Most children are around the time of birth or before birth, but it can be up to two years of age, and it has to affect their physical functioning. So a brain injury in a, a, that is static in an immature brain uh, that uh, affects their physical function. Now, children with cerebral palsy have all kinds of other problems as well. They can have swallowing problems, GI problems, respiratory problems, cognitive problems, all those different things. However, by definition, it's really, it has to be some, some brain injury that affects physical function, and then it has all these whole complexities of other things. And it's the most common motor disorder in children. Now, any type of brain injury can cause this because it runs the gamut. It could be from prematurely with the paraventricular bleeding. And I'll talk about that in a moment. It could be a lack of oxygen. It could be a malformation of the brain that doesn't form fully or an infection. And more, uh, more recently, you've seen a surge in uh, looking at genetic conditions. And uh, Michael Crew, who's the uh, uh, one of the chairs of the uh, new research uh, uh, committee through uh, UCP, uh, he's one of the leading experts in genetic conditions, and it's uh, much more prevalent uh, for cerebral palsy than we thought, so it's between 20 and 40 percent. Kids with CP might have some genetic uh, issue. And so that's an evolving uh, uh, field. Uh, and it can present with various different severities. You can have someone that's very mild and very severe. Now, one of the things I tell parents all the time is, is so that when you present, that's kind of where you stay. If you have a very mild case of cerebral palsy, you're not going to evolve over time to be in the severe case. Uh, you, usually, uh, whatever level of brain damage you have, is really in that, uh, you stay in that realm. However, as you grow and develop, some of the complications of cerebral palsy can make things a little bit more difficult. So for example, if you have a lot of spasticity, which is what this talk is going to be talking about, you can develop contractures and bone deformities and all kinds of other issues over time that can make things more difficult. But the neurologic problem doesn't change, even though there may be some changes in how the child functions over time. So all of those factors influence what you're going to do for treatment. Now, here's some of the physical problems. Now, again, I I, there's all kinds of different problems associated with cerebral palsy, but I'm focusing on the, uh, here on the physical problems. You have strength issues, coordination issues, balance, selective motor control problems, bone deformities, and then you have hypertonia. And there's different types of tone. Uh, we use spasticity as a term that covers all types of high tone in kids with cerebral palsy, but really spasticity is one specific type, and there's dystonia, and there's hyperkinesis or uh, abnormal movement that are associated with that. And I'm going to talk a little more specifically about that in a moment. So hypertonia. So all that means is just increased uh, uh, resistance uh, to movement uh, through a joint, and it can be caused by spasticity, dystonia, or rigidity. So basically, it's just increased uh, uh, muscle tone, uh, whether it be movement or through uh, passive movement or active movement in a child. Uh, and it's really complicated. So all these different tones can kind of have different influences and trying to figure out what uh, a type of treatment works best can be pretty difficult. But I tell our, fem uh, our fellows that if you see a child and you watch them for 30 seconds without asking a single question, you should be able to look at how they move and kind of figure out, at least with some degree of accuracy, what kind of uh, uh, neurologic problem they have and then uh, what their history is and then you uh, hopefully will be able to uh, use that information to determine what types of treatments may be effective and which ones may not be. So I'm going to give you examples of some of the different types of hypertonia. So in this first child, this is a child that has what's called periventricular leukomalacia. Uh, he had some bleeding deep inside his brain uh, when he was born. And he walks, uh, and this is very similar to someone who has, uh, was born prematurely. You can see he's a little more involved on the right side than the left side, but it affects mostly his legs and not the rest of his uh, body. Here's another child who was born with lack of oxygen at term at birth. And although cognitively he does very well, uh, his motor problems are very, very severe. And he has uh, dystonia and spasticity, and it's difficult for him to move. Uh, but uh, this is an example of somebody with a severe lack of oxygen at birth. Now here's another child. She was born prematurely, and similar to the first child I showed you, she's a little more involved. Her uh, amount of bleeding affected uh, uh, her lower extremities, but also affected a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which gives her a little bit of dystonia. And so she's just more extensive uh, bleeding, so she had more extensive problems. She's cognitively normal, though, even though she has difficulty walking. And you're going to see her a couple times later in the talk. Uh, here's, a, 
Here's a child, again, born with uh, severe lack of oxygen, uh, but he's much, much more severely involved than the child I just showed you, and he has severe cognitive issues and really doesn't have any significant purposeful movement. This adolescent uh, has normal cognition. That's the reason why he can figure out how to make his body work and walk. But he has pure dystonia. He doesn't have any spasticity. And he was born at term, but he had uh, jaundice as a baby. And he was, uh, uh, he was born in a refugee camp, and uh, he had connectors. And so he has pure dystonia. Uh, and you can see how he's moving here. And in this child here, well, she's an adolescent as well. Uh, she had a uh, lack of oxygen as well. However, it affected her, uh, her cerebellum and her basal ganglion, which are two centers that are very sensitive. She has a lot of ataxia, and you see a lot of posturing. She has posturing, but uh, she doesn't have a lot of spasticity, and she's cognitively normal as well, uh, but a lot of ataxia that's uh, going on in her movements. So those are just some examples of some of the tone issues that we look at. Motion is very complicated. There's all these different centers of the brain that are, in, that are uh, involved in uh, uh, motion. And it's the cerebral cortex where the initiation movement is, the basal ganglia, which, is, uh, uh, which uh, coordinates uh, uh, some of these movements. There's the thalamus, which is the kind of the central processor where all these signals that are coming in and out from the various different brain areas to move. The cerebellum, which controls the, uh, uh, the coordination of your movements. And then there's different types of uh, reflexes that you have inherently that are in the brain stem and spinal cord. So all of these systems need to work in concert for just even a simple movement of throwing a ball or uh, walking across the room. And if you have a problem with any one of these, you can have problems with your movement. So this is just a schematic, just looking at that and just shows you all the different complexities. So any simple movement that you have involves all these systems, and these are all these signals that are going back and forth throughout your body. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about spasticity. So spasticity is actually increased uh, resistant to uh, movement that is velocity dependent, meaning that the faster you move, the more that your body kicks in and stops it. So it's velocity dependent increase in tone. Now, it's based on your reflexes that you have throughout the body. Now, reflexes through your body are very, very important. It's important for movement. It's kind of like the spring on your screen door. So the spring on your screen door allows you to open up the door and it closes nicely behind you. So if the spring on a screen door, for those of you who are uh, old enough to know what a uh, spring on a screen door actually is, if you open up a screen door and you walk through, it should close nicely behind you. But if it's set too tight as you walk through, it'll clip you on the heels and if it's set too loose when you open it up it won't close properly behind it so you want it set just right so the body has the same system and this is your reflexes to get it so that when you go to catch a ball that your muscle tone is just right so you can do that if it's too loose your muscles have to reel themselves in and the ball's by you before you get your hand out and if it's too tight you can't reach up because the muscles won't allow you to reach and so there's all these systems and reflexes being one of them if you have damage to your spinal cord or your brain then the control of those reflexes can be gone and then the default is for them to become hyperreactive. And so you become tight and you have spasticity. And so it becomes too tight. And the mother nature designed us so that we have the default is high because if you think about trying to get away from the wolf, if you have some kind of neurologic damage and you have one leg that has uh, uh, some neurologic damage and it was loose or floppy, you'd be dragging around that leg. However, if it's tight, then you can at least bounce off of it and try to get away from the wolf. And so the default is for it to be too tight. But sometimes and when you have neurologic damage, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And so we have to reduce spasticity because it creates complications uh, uh, that uh, really aren't fully benefiting us. And so in a, in a reflex, what happens is, is this in this schematic, is, is if you tap below your kneecap, what it does is it stretches your quadriceps. So you tap below your kneecap, stretches your quadriceps. There's your little stretch receptors in there. It sends a signal up to your spinal cord, and it makes a connection uh, to a nerve that goes down into your uh, muscle, to your quadriceps, cause it to contract, and you get your, your knee jerk. And so that's how you get your knee jerk, and that's a, a normal reflex. Now, in a normal situation, the brain senses, OK, you had your one uh, uh, knee jerk, that's all, and it dampens it. It doesn't let it continue. Uh, but if you have damage to that, what happens is that signal, you stretch your quadricep, you, it sends a signal up to your spinal cords, it sends a signal back down your quadricep, causes it to contract, and that contraction in and of itself stretches the stretch receptors, which sends a signal back up uh, to the spinal cord, which sends it back down into the, uh, the muscle, causes it to contract, and it sets up this vicious cycle, and that's spasticity. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So clonus is probably the most uh, 
uh, which is an uh, ankle that uh, keeps beating. Uh, that's a normal reflex that's become hyperactive and it cycles just right so you get that beating uh, response. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's spasticity because of uh, some brain injury. So, in children with, uh, that are born prematurely, commonly what happens with them is, is that they have some bleeding deep inside their brain. And uh, children that are born prematurely, the blood vessels that are deep inside their brain are just developing, and so they're very fragile. And after you're born, your blood pressure systems change, and so your blood pressure increases, and so those fragile blood, uh, vessels can bleed. And so in a child that's born prematurely, if they have some bleeding, they have what's called periventricular leukomalacia, which basically means there's some brain damage in the area around the ventricle. If you have a small amount of bleeding, you'll have just a small amount of periventricular leukomalacia. If you have a more extensive uh, bleeding, you'll have more severe bleeding and it affects you uh, uh, more severely. Now, if you look at the homunculus and the way that the body is designed and the brain is laid out with all the nerve fibers, if you have some damage near the ventricle, it affects your legs uh, more than your arms because that's where those fibers are. And as it becomes more extensive, it starts to involve your, your arms and your face more. And so a child that's born premature who has mild periventricular leukomalacia, they may have some damage into the areas that have, uh, control their legs and their arms could be relatively spared. And as they get to be, have more severe bleeding, they have uh, uh, more problems with their arms. So if you remember from the videos I just showed you, the child that was relatively mild periventricular leukomalacia, he had mild bleeding, whereas the child that was using the walker had more severe bleeding and had more involvement in various parts of the brain. So here's that child again. So he has some pretty mild periventricular leukomalacia, and here's another child that has a little more severe, and you can see that she, uh, she's a little bit more involved uh, with her periventricular leukomalacia. Both of these children are, have cognitively normal, and uh, both of them have fairly good uh, hand function. Uh, now, if you're born closer to term, there's other parts of the brain that are more susceptible to damage. And so patients that have hemiplegia or one side of involvement, oftentimes they're born at term, and then there's some uh, uh, clot or some type of blood vessel issue that affects the middle cerebral artery, similar to a stroke in an elderly person. That can happen in a young child as well, because that's the area that's most susceptible. And they'll have more involvement, if you look at the homunculus here, you have more involvement in your arm and your face and less involvement in their leg. Now, oftentimes they'll have involvement in their uh, leg as well but uh, they can have uh, uh, more issues with their arm. Uh, and then uh, there's other a term, you can have other issues that uh, if you have a lack of oxygen, it tends to damage the basal ganglia more, and so you can see some of that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I'll show you an example of a child that was born at term that had a stroke. And you can see that his hemorrhage is on the right, and you can see that uh, he's uh, with walking, he has a little bit of involvement on his left side. He's not severe, but his arm is more involved than his leg, and he walks pretty good, but he walks a little bit on his toes on that left side. Now, the basal ganglia, that's one of those control centers that makes movements so that, they, uh, that they're uh, uh, really uh, uh, very well coordinated. And if you have damage to that area, your muscles just kind of tighten up and you have all these different uh, uh, contractions and contortions of your muscles when you're trying to move them. And, and so that's called dystonia. And so those are the involuntary movements when you try to move. So if someone has dystonia and they try to move, everything just fires. And you can have someone that starts to talk and they get excited and then their foot will start to posture. And they, so it all kicks in. So it's kind of an all or nothing. Everything's moved uh, when you try to do something. Both the antagonist and agonist muscles are really firing. And, um, and I'll show you again. This is the person you saw before. So he had damage to his basal ganglia and his reflexes are normal. But every time he tries to move, everything fires all at the same time. But he's, he's able to control those movements well enough that he can do some walking. Now, the cerebellum, that's, that's important for coordination. Uh, and so that uh, when you try to reach for something, if your cerebellum is not working right, you, you'll start to wobble and have what's called ataxia. Uh, it's also important for cognition too. So if, you have a, if a young child has damage to their cerebellum, they oftentimes have cognitive issues too because it coordinates cognitive functioning as well. And most people don't think about that. But this is a girl that had uh, uh, some anoxia at birth and it damaged her cerebellum. And, uh, at least that's what we think. Uh, and you can see her movements. As she reaches, she doesn't have that writhing. She doesn't have increased reflexes. Her range of motion is fine. Uh, but uh, she has significant problems with movement. Uh, so she has, she's able to take steps and walk with big steps uh, in uh, fluid movements, but her legs are all over the place. So she needs a walker to get around because those legs will go all over the place. 
All right. So with all those different uh, uh, problems, there's a, in particular with hypertonia, there's all kinds of different treatment options. The mainstay is physical and occupational therapy. There's oral medications. There's uh, bracing and casting to kind of position you better. There's neurolytic blocks, which we'll talk about a little more specifically, and that's specifically phenol blocks and botulinum toxin injections. There's orthopedic surgery. Uh, now, orthopedic surgery doesn't specifically treat spasticity, but it lengthens out the rubber band, so to speak, so it loosens it up. So temporarily, it can reduce your tone. Uh, there's, uh, there's neurosurgical procedures like an intrathecal baclofen pump, selective dorsal rhizotomies, deep brain stimulator, and eventual dorsal rhizotomy, and I'll talk about that in a, a little bit more detail. Now, the goal for any type of treatment helps improve function. It's not to get rid of the tone. It's not to get uh, rid of any kind of uh, the contracture per se. What it is is that you're hoping by uh, eliminating or minimizing some of those problems, the child's able to function uh, better. And so really that is your goal. You want to focus on that. If you do a treatment where you get rid of the clonus at the ankle, but it doesn't affect any of their positioning or cares or how they move, and then you really don't need to address it. It's if it's causing a problem, the treatment helps is what you're looking for. So I'm going to talk about neurolytic blocks. So the two mainstays are phenol and botulinum toxins that I talked about. These are focal injections, not systemic. So you've got to pick and choose your muscles carefully. And so you've got to pick the ones you think that are, that are going to have the most impact and that are going to have the biggest bang for your buck and, and try to address those. Phenol tends to last a little bit longer. Uh, and we hope that it lasts at least 3 to 12 months. But to be honest, if I get 4 to 6, I'm usually pretty happy. But it tends to last a little bit longer than uh, botulinum toxin injections. And you can use uh, phenol with botulinum toxin together because you can have some limits in dosing. So phenol is basically you just drip is dripping phenol right on top of a uh, uh, a nerve and phenol is an alcohol and it breaks down or denatures a nerve. So if you drip it onto a nerve going to a muscle that's too tight, it will de uh, denervate it uh, temporarily and block the signal from getting through and loosen it up. And uh, here it kind of shows you a schematic of if you inject, uh, this, is, this is raw egg white, and I'm just injecting uh, uh, phenol uh, directly in 6% phenol directly onto the raw egg white. And you can see that uh, after about uh, uh, 10 seconds, uh, there's, uh, you can see that it's uh, kind of coagulated, so it's uh, chemically fried it, so it's uh, white. And then after about a minute, uh, it's a little bit wider, and after about 10 minutes, it extends out. And so this is what happens with the nerve when you do that. And so if you do that on a nerve, it will reduce some of the uh, spasticity. Uh, we use an electrical stimulator to locate, uh, locate the nerve, so we, we shock the nerves, and uh, when, we, when we see the muscle contracting that we want to have an effect on, we know we're close, uh, and then we home in on it, and we get to a certain stimulus level, we know we're right on top of it, and we inject, phase the nerve, and phenol breaks it down. Now, botulinum toxin works in a different manner. What it does is it blocks the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So basically, acetylcholine is the tra neurotransmitter that uh, uh, connects the nerve to the muscle to make it the, mu uh, the muscle contract. And so when you have a signal that comes down the nerve, when it makes that connection with the muscle, there's, the nerve releases acetylcholine, causes the muscle to contract, and, and uh, you have movement. However, if, uh, you have, if you're poisoned with botulinum toxin, what happens is, is that that signal comes down, but when it gets to the nerve ending, it doesn't release acetylcholine. So so it denervates the muscle in that manner. And now if you inject directly into the muscle, you can uh, knock out some of those nerves and you can loosen up the muscles and make them uh, 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 less tight. And then hopefully you improve some of the movement. It doesn't paralyze the muscle uh, uh, per se, but it knocks out enough of them, you hope, to have a, a clinical benefit. And so that's how, and it lasts about four to six months. It wears off, three to six months, it wears off over that period of time. So there are nerve, uh, uh, neuromuscular junctions or nerve connections with the muscles all throughout uh, the muscles. And so uh, uh, you basically, when you do an injection, because they're kind of spread out, those connections, you just spread the uh, botulinum toxin uh, throughout those muscles and you inject in various different areas. And this is just the gastroc and showing just the, the, the common areas is four different areas with a medial and lateral head where you inject. Now I'm going to show you an example. And this girl you saw before was born prematurely with cerebral palsy. And this is her walking. And you can see that her tone interferes very, very severely with her ability to walk. And so we injected her with phenol into her uh, obturators or her hip adductors for the scissoring, and then also uh, did botulinum toxin to her uh, hamstrings and gastrocs. And this is her a month later. So you can see a month later, she's walking much better. And so before, she really didn't have any functional walk at all. And then literally a month later, the mother drove up, 
pulled the walker out of the trunk of the car and put it down. She walked in. That was the first time. So she could, uh, uh, she could walk uh, uh, very well following that. Uh, and then I have hers uh, a little bit later, too, because we talk about some of the long-term issues uh, with her. Here's another example. This is a child that had uh, uh, a neurologic problem and affected his right arm. He's right-handed, and you can see that this is Cooper, and his ability to write was very difficult. He learned to do pretty well with his left hand, uh, but then we did some injections in uh, some of the muscles in his forearm to loosen up some of that ataxia and that movement and the hyperkinetic movements that he had, and a few months later, uh, you can see how much better he can write. Now, he still writes better with his left than his right, but he's much better with his right, and because his right hand dominant, he actually started using his right hand for these activities as opposed to his left. And uh, it's interesting that hemiplegic patients, if you have their dominant arms involved, they'll use their right hand or their dominant hand as much as they can, even if their uh, uninvolved side that's non-dominant uh, has better dexterity. They really want to use that uh, other hand. And so we were able to provide that for Cooper. And that lasted a year for him. So it lasted a really long time. So he did really well with this. That's a little unusual though. So orthopedic surgery. Now this corrects bony deformities, helps prevent hip dislocations, optimizes base support and joint position. So it's very, very helpful in, on these kids that we, uh, uh, that we work with. And, uh, but it only temporarily reduces uh, spasticity because those muscles can reel those muscles. Uh, the uh, muscles will reel the, uh, themselves back in over time. Uh, and it really has some limited effects with the dystonic posture with this. There's not like good orthopedic surgeries for like the, the, the uh, adolescent that I showed you walking with cornicterus. But I'll give you some exam I'll give you an example here of uh, some of the benefits of orthopedic surgery, though. And this is someone who had spasticity and had significant contractures as a result of that, and it was causing him to have some difficulties with walking. And this is him uh, a year after his orthopedic surgery, where we loosened up those muscles that were too tight. And you can see he has a marked improvement in his ability to get around, much more comfortable, able to walk longer distances. So again, significantly improved his function. Now, now I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, the, some of the neurosurgical procedures. Now, first I want to talk about is the intrathecal baclofen pump. So intrathecal baclofen pump is a pump that uh, infuses baclofen and it drips it directly on the spinal cord. Baclofen is a medication you take orally, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. Uh, and so someone had the bright idea, well, forget the blood-brain barrier, I'll just drip it right on the spinal cord where you want it to have an effect because it blocks that monosynaptic reflex arc that's, uh, uh, that we talked about earlier. And uh, so if you uh, in, implant a, a pump and it slowly drips baclofen on the spinal cord. You can treat dyspasticity. It also has an effect on dystonia too, so it actually treats both of them. And you can put the catheter tip all along the spinal cord wherever you want it. The most common area is down in the lower thoracic area, but you can put it up in the cervical area, and some people have done that. It tends to be best for patients that are more involved in the GMFCS fours and fives. Um, uh, because it can cause some weakness of your muscles, and if you're ambulatory, it can kind of negate some of the benefits. Uh, but it can it can help with some of the uh, non uh, with the ambulatory patients as well. Uh, and this just schematically kind of shows uh, uh, the pump. Usually you've, you've planted uh, the pump underneath the skin in the right lower abdominal area, thread the catheter around to the spinal cord uh, through the vertebrae, and you thread it up. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. This is a child with uh, familial spastic paraparesis. And this is him walking. Now he's very functional. His arms aren't, aren't involved, it's just his legs. His dad has the same condition. And you can see when he walks, he's, he just has a lot of tightness. And I'll fast forward this a little bit. And we implanted a backbone pump, and this is him afterwards. Now you notice he still has some gait issues, not perfect, but he's much smoother, much more comfortable. So he loved it. He, and his, actually his dad was so impressed, his dad got one too, so it was a family kind of thing. Uh, and so it really, uh, he felt uh, uh, he could walk longer distances and he wasn't as tired and he wasn't as sore afterwards. Now here's another child. There's a before on the left and an after on the right. Now watch when he turns here. Uh, after the pump, because of the decrease in uh, tone, he was able to turn a little bit easier. It's a little, a little more difficult in turning because you couldn't stop. It's kind of like riding a bike when you got a uh, uh, high tone. When you stop uh, pedaling a bike, you, you know, you tend to fall over. Well, same thing with these kids. When they're going, they're pretty good, but when they stop and try to turn, uh, they have a tendency to fall. And this child here, you can see where he fell. So he was much more comfortable and did much better with it as well. So it didn't cure their problem, but it made a significant functional improvement for both of these children. We talked about the monosynaptic reflex arc. Now, if you were to break up this reflex arc, you could reduce the tone in the muscles, but if you cut the motor nerves going down into the muscles, you weaken the muscle, and so that could have a negative effect. But if you 
cut some of the nerves coming from the, the stretch receptors or the sensory nerves, you might be able to affect that reflex arc but still preserve strength. And that's the, that's a, a selective dorsal rhizotomy. That's a premise for the selective dorsal rhizotomy. And so uh, before a rhizotomy, uh, uh, you're looking at uh, the abnormal uh, monosynaptic reflex arc because of lack of, of uh, signals from the brain getting through, whether it be from a spinal cord injury or brain injury. And afterwards, uh, if you selectively cut just a few of those sensory nerves and perverse, uh, you still preserve sensation, you can reduce spasticity. And in, and in Gillette, we do so with uh, uh, some monitoring where we tease out and test those sensory nerves and we pick the ones that seem to be interfering or causing most of the spasticity and selectively cut those and we cut anywhere from 25 to 40%. So that's enough to preserve sensation quite well and you still uh, preserve strength and movement. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples here. So here's two children with cerebral palsy, both walking with walkers. And you can see they're very similarly involved. Now one child, uh, they chose to do a rhizotomy, and I'm gonna show you the 10 year follow-up. Another child, they decided to do orthopedic surgery because of different, uh, different issues going on in their lives. They didn't wanna do the uh, rhizotomy. And so this is, uh, uh, this is 10 years later. And then this is nine years later after the uh, orthopedic surgery. So you can see that the child uh, who had the rhizotomy with the species reduced is doing much better than the child that just had the orthopedic surgery because that, that tone reeled those muscles back in and they got tight again. She's still ambulatory, but she's having more difficulties. And uh, we'll talk about her later because she ultimately decided to do a rhizotomy because she started to deteriorate and she got to be adolescent. She started stopped being able to walk and walk in less uh, uh, distances and things like that, whereas the other child uh, continued. So what about the complex patients that are spastic and dysonic? Now, most of our patients that are very uh, severely involved, the GMF says fours and five, will have a combination of spasticity and dystonia. And dystonia doesn't, doesn't respond to the uh, selective dorsal rhizotomy very well, because you remember it's not part of that reflex arc, so that doesn't. Uh, and we have a deep brain stimulator, which I'll talk about, but the deep brain stimulator doesn't affect cerebral palsy as well as it does like genetic issues or other problems. And then oral medications and baclofen pumps may not be enough. Sometimes the baclofen pump's a perfect solution for these children. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't work as well as we like, and uh, oral medications can be difficult to manage these kids too. Here's just a list of the oral medications, and we try all of these, and sometimes we get lucky and they, they really help, but a lot of times they don't. And we usually have a cocktail. Usually most of these kids are pretty severely involved will be on two or three, if, if not more, of these medications. So. With, with the, those issues, uh, if you've got somebody that's non-ambulatory, if you cut the, the, the sensory nerves of the dorsal nerves, you can re, uh, reduce their spasticity, but if you cut the ventral nerves or the motor nerves, you can also reduce their dystonia as well and some of the movement, and you cause some weakness, but if they're non-ambulatory and they're not using that movement functionally, then you might actually be able to uh, improve their ability to be cared for and positioned in comfort level, and so functionally you can improve them in that manner. And so that's the ventral dorsal rhizotomy, and that's what we've been doing uh, at Gillette for a number of years, and we're slowly uh, uh, you know, uh, improving our techniques and, uh, and, the, and the patient selection. But we cut about 50% of the dorsal roots and about 90% of the ventral roots. You have to cut a lot of the motor nerves because the nerves tend to sprout. And so if you have only have 20% of your nerves left, motor nerves left, it will sprout out and innervate all those muscles like after a year, almost like uh, you didn't hardly do anything. So you gotta cut a lot of them. So we cut around 90%. You can get by with a, a few less than that, uh, but uh, you do have to cut a lot more of the, the motor nerves than you do the uh, dorsal nerves. Uh, and in polio, uh, you know, if you only have 20% re of uh, your motor nerves preserved, uh, you can get near normal strength return. So it's a similar kind of uh, issue that's going on here. So we do a non-selective uh, ventral dorsal rhizotomy at the, in the lumbar area. You can do it in the cervical area, it's a lot trickier there, but in the lumbar area you can do it and really reduce the tone in the lower extremities. And we do it like L1 uh, through S2, and we're talking about just doing S1 now, so we uh, minimize some bladder issues potentially with that. So it's best for the more severely involved who has severe dystonia and spasticity. It permanently reduces their tone if you cut enough of the ventral roots. If you don't cut enough of the ventral roots, you can get some of that tone uh, uh, return. And we've done about 50 uh, uh, patients, and the very large majority of those had significant improvement. And you can have some urinary retention. That's less than 5%, but it's rare that it's long term. Uh, but it does diminish strength, so you've got to be careful with that. Now. The deep brain stem. I don't show you an example right now because I only have one good video of that, so I'll shave, I'm going to save that in just a moment. So uh, uh, dystonia uh, surgeries is uh, one of the uh, things that have come out more recently is the deep brain stimulator, which is 
stimulating the basal ganglia, the origin of where the stony is. If you have some damage in how the basal ganglia works, if you stimulate the basal ganglia, you sometimes can reduce the tone. And what happens is if you stimulate the basal ganglia, there's inhibitory uh, uh, pathways that are there. Uh, and so there's stimulatory and inhibitory pathways. If you stimulate uh, the inhibitory pathways, you hopefully will dampen some of that uh, tone signals that are being cranked out by the basal ganglia because of the damage and its poor regulation. Now, if they don't, if they don't have good uh, uh, axon preservation, like in a secondary dystonia, secondary dystonia means if you have some kind of damage, whether it be a, a stroke or uh, lack of oxygen or something, you can damage those wires uh, that are there, the inhibitory wires. And so if you stimulate them, if those wires aren't working, it doesn't matter how much you stimulate it's nothing The signal's not going to affect you. But if you have something that's more cellular, and that's more some of the inherited uh, uh, conditions uh, where the wires are intact, just the cells aren't working properly, if you stimulate those inhibitory pathways, you can get a significant reduction. However, in patients with cerebral palsy, if they have enough of those inhibitory pathways present, you can have a positive effect. It may not be perfect, but you can have a positive effect. And so I'll show you an example of that. So this is a patient with cerebral palsy, and he's got significant dystonia. And this is him moving there, and this is him walking. Now watch how wide his feet are when he's walking. So take, take a notice of that. So he walks in, get around. Uh, and you can turn pretty well, but he's, he's a little unstable and he's got a wide base of support. Now, this is him afterwards. Now I'm going to move it forward here a little bit so that you can see his left hand, because that's the one that you need to notice. And his left hand is, is moving a little more fluidly. He thought it was more comfortable. He, he could do more things. It's about the same, but watch his walking and watch his base of support. Look how narrow his base is there. His feet are really close together, so he could walk much more easily. Before he had to walk, his feet were pretty wide apart. And he was a little more unstable. But afterwards, he was able to get his legs together. So even though it's subtle, to him it was a big deal. He really was much more comfortable, and he really liked the effects of the deep brain stimulator. Again, sometimes just the subtle things are the best things. Uh, we talked about the basal ganglia, and we talked about uh, the deep brain stimulator can be an effect, but then we talked about uh, for all the different types of tone, an intrathecal baclofen pump uh, may be effective. And this is an example of a really complex patient that, uh, that had an uh, uh, intrathecal baclofen pump and it helped, but still had a lot of tone. And so we wanted to do more. So ultimately what this child had was uh, he had a deep brain stimulator that was implanted. And here's just, a, uh, you can see the electrodes in the basal ganglia part of the brain. You can see what uh, those are in the, uh, in the slide here. And in this here, uh, you can see some of the wires. There's a little stimulator that's put on just the upper part of the chest. And that's the, the generator and it runs, the wires run down. And you can see them coming down to the basal ganglia there. Uh, and if you look really close, let me see, I think I have the next one. Uh, there's a catheter that's going into the ventricle that's the intrathecal uh, back. It doesn't show up very well. I don't know if y'all gonna be able to see that very easily, actually. It's right there. But uh, anyways, it's the catheter that goes in the ventricle for, so he had both. He had intraventricular baclofen and a deep brain stimulator. And I'm gonna show you, you've seen him earlier before. He's got good cognition, but significant movement problems. So this is him trying to move. You can see everything just firing all the time. And he can't really control hardly anything. He can roll a little bit. And this is him after both of those treatments. And this doesn't look like a whole lot, but uh, he's sitting there very, very comfortably. Uh, and his tone is not increased uh, significantly. And he can lift up and uh, drive his chair uh, in a relatively functional manner. It's not perfect, but he can at least get around. So he was much happier because he could drive his chair now, whereas before, every time he tried to get that joystick, he just couldn't do it. It was all over the place. So this allowed him to uh, move around independently with his electric wheelchair. All right. Now, you remember this child bef uh, from before. I'll skip to the, that's what she looked like before. And this is her after with peak surgery. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So. This is her walking before again, I mean afterwards, nine years afterwards. And then so she decided, she was deteriorating, she's having problems, so she decided to have a selective dorsal rhizotomy. And so this is her walking three years after her rhizotomy. She's still in the walker. She still has all those contractures that were there. You can see she's walking much more fluidly. She's looser, she's not quite contracting all at the same time like it was before. But she's still having some issues and those contractures are interfering. 
So this is here a year after she had some revisions and had some additional surgery, and she's still walking. Now for her, she was she was ecstatic because she was she could walk longer distances, she could maintain herself in the community and walk uh, walk in the mall and things like that. Whereas before, it was just tired out too much. But if you were to time her from before and after, she actually walked faster before we did the rhizotomy and the, and the repeat orthopedic surgery. So we, she slowed down, uh, but she's walking longer distances, and she's also starting to take some steps without holding on to anything across the room, which she never ever could do before. So in her mind, she's gotten significantly better, and she's very happy. But when you do all these things, you know, you, you kind of want to be worthwhile. We want it to be worthwhile. And so, uh, you know, in her mind, she, she uh, you know, she did the right thing, but she don't want to go, oh, I wish I didn't do all that. I mean, there's a tendency not to do that and for us too. So I think we did the right thing, but when you look at the speed of walking, it's, it's different. You can make an argument and we should have just left her alone. Uh, I, I think that she wouldn't put up with that. I know her mom wouldn't, wouldn't have agreed to that because they, they're much happier with where they are now. But uh, it just kind of illustrates some of the difficulties and some of, some of the consequences you have in doing these treatments is uh, we kind of slowed her down a little bit, uh, but we allowed her to walk a longer distances and more comfortably, and we hopefully will reserve her ability to walk for the next two to three decades. Uh, so, uh, so we'll see. I mean, it's still too early to, to know all that. Now, uh, I should have prefaced my talk by telling you I'm showing you my greatest hits. I'm not showing you all the problems. I'm showing the ones that look the best. So not everybody looks uh, as good with the before and after treatments as some of these. I'm showing you some of the better ones. But again, this is a girl that's born prematurely. And then this is her one month after her injections. And you can see how much easier she is to move. Well, this is her 13 years later. Now, she had a backflip pump that was implanted because she had some increased tone. She had some dystonia and wanted to treat that. In hindsight, I probably would have done a, uh, probably would have done a, a rhizotomy. I think she would probably have been better served with a rhizotomy than a backflip pump. But uh, she's done well with uh, uh, all of that. And uh, if I can get this, oh, there we go. Now, this is her walking now. Now, she insists on walking with a lost strength crutches, so she's so proud that she can walk with her lost strength crutches. She wants to do that. Uh, and she has a wheelchair that she gets around in, but then around, the, uh, around her room, uh, she just walks. And you can see that she's not quite as fluid as she was before. Uh, and so, you know, with all these treatments we've done over the last 13 years, uh, did, should we have done something different? Uh, she, uh, she's avoided a lot of orthopedic surgery because she didn't have a lot of the hip deformities and contractions, so we avoided those. Uh, but um, in hindsight, uh, maybe we would have done uh, a couple of things a little bit different. I can tell you she's very happy. She's, she feels comfortable, but it's certainly not moving as well as she was when she was little. And uh, ideally, we would have been able to preserve that ability to move with that level uh, of fluidity and uh, endurance. This is a very, very difficult case, and, and these, are, uh, these are the kids that are pretty common. This is uh, the child we showed earlier, um, and he had uh, anoxic injury uh, at birth and horrible movement issues and tone. He's just tight everywhere. And this is him 12 hours out of day. He sleeps 12 hours out of day, and he's like this 12 hours a day. He nonstop motion. And you can see we can, uh, how cachectic he is. He's got a G2, and even if you try to feed him to increase those calories, uh, what happens is, is that his, his gut shuts down, so he has gut issues on top of it. I even injected um, uh, around his uh, anal sphincter to help him uh, uh, with botulinum toxin to help evacuate his bowels, and, and that had some effect, but it really wasn't enough. And he had a baclofen pump, because you can see the dressing over top of his right lower quadrant, and he eroded through it. I mean, he moved so much, and he was so cachectic that he just eroded right through it. And so even though that was helpful, uh, it, uh, it wasn't enough. And I injected all kinds of different things, and here's a slew of medications we had them all at the same time, and it just wasn't enough. And he had an ACE and a metrophenol trying to accommodate for his bowel and bladder issues. He was very, very difficult, and we really weren't uh, uh, able to control it. I, I said lack of oxygen, he had staph uh, meningitis, I'm sorry. Uh, we thought about a ventral dorsal rhizotomy. And so he d had a rhizotomy uh, in the lumbar area, uh, in the upper sacral area. So he had a, uh, the ventral, 75% of the ventral roots were cut and about 40% of the dorsal roots were cut. And this is him afterwards. So this is him a year later. Now I see him sitting quietly. He never did this before. And this is him and his sister. I, you know, I always joke, I say, if you can't get your sister to get a rise out of you, you know you're doing pretty good. So this is how he's it all the time. It's, this is not just 
cherry picking a nice moment. Uh, and this is him trying to move. And you can see he's got a little bit of movement in his legs because they're significantly weaker, but he's still moving his arms. So they finally got him to move. But that's the most. So he's much more. So his life changed completely. The parent's life changed completely. I mean, he could, uh, you can see he's gaining weight. He could, uh, so he had a marked, marked improvement in the quality of his life as well as his family's quality of life. Uh, and so, I mean, he went to, to coming down and we were seeing him every, every couple of months. They live uh, a little bit of ways and uh, uh, to just see him once a year as a social call. I mean, he did markedly, markedly better. So that was a good outcome for us. I'll show you another case. So this is a case of the child that uh, was on a uh, atypical uh, neuroleptic uh, medication and developed tardive dyskinesia. And his left uh, uh, arm uh, had significant uh, issues. And you can see his right arm's moving well there. And he's gonna try to move his left arm here in a second. Let's see if I can go there. Yeah, let's get that. And you can see he really has a hard time doing that. And then uh, here's him walking. Look at the posturing of his left arm. He walks pretty well, but he's still got some of the posturing of the left arm. And so we did a deep brain simulator. And for tardive dyskinesia, actually deep brain simulator is very, very effective. So it works very well. So this is him afterwards. You can see how much better that movement is. And it's worked for a number of years. You can see that's how many years later, because he's a lot older here. And he can really use that, leg, uh, that arm uh, quite well. And then this is him walking. And you can see how much better his swing is, as much better his posture. He's been extremely happy with this, and it's worked extremely well for him. Uh, here's another uh, example. This is a child, we're not quite sure what she has. She doesn't have any of the risk factors. Uh, the genetic testing has been equivocal up to this point. Probably should check her again, because there's so, so many more things that we're pulling out. But this is her walking. Now, she doesn't look like she has a lot of spasticity. She looks hypotonic when you watch her walk in fluid. Uh, but uh, she's got clonus at her uh, ankles and she's got contractures or hamstrings and her hip adductors are a little bit tight, not horribly tight. She's not scissoring a whole lot here. So we weren't sure quite what to do. So we started off by treating her just a little bit with botulinum toxin and her gastroc, see if that helped. That helped a little bit, but not quite as much. So we got a little braver and go, okay, let's do their hamstrings too. So we had gastrox and hamstring. That worked a little bit better, and so like, okay, well, let's try some more. So we did. I did phenol blocks to her uh, hip adductors, her obturator nerves, and, and botulinum toxin to her hamstrings and gastrox, and this is her a month after that. Now she's walking all over the place. So she had a marked improvement. I, I'll be honest, I didn't expect that. This is one of the more complicated kids. The dad was stoked, obviously. He was happy because she can walk him. She can walk everywhere now. So, and it wore off after about six or eight months, and I'd do it again. And she kept doing really, really well with it. Ultimately, she had a rhizotomy and did well with that as well. Uh, and so, uh, this is a complicated kid that at the beginning, you just wouldn't expect her to, uh, spasticity reduction would be the, the treatment of choice for her. But it ended up that it actually worked out pretty well. And I cautiously kind of walked through it, but it worked out uh, pretty well for her. All right, now, I'm going to show you the best rhizotomy you've ever had. Now, I showed you this kid before, uh, periventricular Luke Malaysia. So his brain looks just like a preemie, although he was born closer to term. Uh, he's involved on the right side of my life. So I did injections and casting, and his muscles just laughed at me and just spit it out. It just didn't really do anything. And so then we did a rhizotomy. And so this is him a year later. You can see him walking here, and he's being a little bit goofy, but that's him walking. Now I'm going to show you two years later. I watch him at the end there turn and spin. So this kid, he got so good at his motive movements that he played on a local youth soccer team and he played at the elite level with all the other kids. He didn't he was on the top team. Uh, so he wasn't on a special a special team. He wasn't on the C team. He was on the A team. Uh, that's how well he did. So he did remarkably well with just the reside of and we didn't have to do anything else. Uh, we haven't seen him for a while because he's been, uh, I hope he's still doing really well, but he did remarkably well with that. Now I'm going to show you one other. This one I'm going to show you just because it was a difficult case. I don't have an after of this, but I wonder if anybody can guess what this kid has. I'm going to let you watch for here. I can tell you he's been, he was worked up. He had three MRIs of his spine that, uh, plain MRIs that didn't show anything. He had all kinds of different blood work. He had lab work done on his CSF, and uh, he had various different diagnoses, but nothing that uh, stuck. Everything just kind of went away. And uh, I will tell you that Dr. Novacek's one that kind of saw him in the gate lab and said, have you ever done a 
MRI with contrast, and I said, no, he's seen six neurologists and they haven't done it with contrast. So we did one with contrast. Ends up he had a spinal cord tumor. It just didn't show up on a plain x-ray, and so we took it out, and he actually did quite well. Uh, but this is the typical gait. I've had three patients with spinal cord tumors, and exactly how they walk. Uh, that pelvis just, just kind of rotates. It doesn't move too much. They got, uh, uh, they're straightened out their lumbar lordosis. They, uh, and their hamstrings are crazy tight. So their hamstrings are crazy tight and not too tight uh, elsewhere. So it's a very unique uh, uh, walking pattern. So, uh, but ultimately we were figured out what he had and, and actually uh, uh, did the right thing for him. He was deteriorating over time. Uh, he was uh, much less involved and younger than he was right there. Uh, but ultimately did very, very well. He played competitive basketball with his peers in school and things, so he did pretty well. Now, last one. This is kind of a quiz. So this is not too dissimilar from the patient I showed you earlier that was in pink as well, uh, that we didn't know quite what to do and ended up treating their spasticity and kind of marching up. I'm wondering what you would do with this one. I just want to give to all the residents and the fellows. Actually, this child doesn't have spasticity or hypertonia. They have hypotonia and they're weak. So this child has spinal muscular atrophy and they're able to ambulate with a walker, but you wouldn't want to touch their muscles. You don't want to treat this. This is a, uh, this is a weak muscle that's hypotonic. And even though it looks uh, similar to the uh, child I showed you earlier. She doesn't have uh, clonus like that other child does. She doesn't have contractures like that other child does. And so she's, uh, she's completely different even though her gait pattern may look pretty similar. Uh, and so, uh, so those are some of the complicated patients that we've had. There's some of the major treatments that uh, we use. And uh, I'll give you a basic overview. Hopefully uh, you have a little bit better understanding of some of these kids we see and some of the options they have, we have for them. Uh, thank you. Hi, Dr. Gormley. Good to see Hello. you. Hello. Can you hear I me? Have yep, we can hear you. I have questions for you. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm doing a clinic in Jamaica, and so I'm in Jamaica right now, and uh, we do this three times a year. It's the first one in the last two and a half years because of COVID, uh, and I'm sitting, uh, actually, it's a beautiful scene right here. I'm sitting at the top of a mountain overlooking Kingston. Uh, but my Wi-Fi is a little iffy, uh, so if I blank out, I'll try to call back. But go ahead, Maria. Okay, okay. So would you explain the difference between a non-selective and a selective dorsal rhizotomy? So a non-selective dors uh, a non-selective rhizotomy, dorsal rhizotomy, is one in which we don't monitor the uh, uh, the response of the individual nurse. So when you do a rhizotomy, you tease out the dorsal rootlets, the sensory rootlets in the lumbar area of the spine. You tease them out into a number of uh, anywhere from uh, 100 to 200 to sometimes 250 rootlets. And then uh, in a non-selective dorsal rhizotomy, you just cut a certain percentage. So like here in Jamaica, where we don't have monitoring, we cut 25% randomly. We just go at one every four we cut. Whereas in, uh, at Gillette, uh, we do a selective in which we stimulate each one of those rootlets and then we monitor on their legs what the response is. And there's some, some of the times when you stimulate those rootlets, it'll give a classic spastic response where everything fires and you get clonus and other things. And other times it just gives a simple one uh, uh, reflex uh, and that's it and it stops. And we consider that normal. And the ones that propagate, uh, we consider abnormal and cut the ones that are the most abnormal. So that's the difference. Great. Now, as far as that, as far as efficacy, I, I can't say that we've seen a lot of difference in the kids in Jamaica. And I saw two kids today that we did rhizotomies on last uh, in February of 2020, right before the outbreak of COVID. And they look very good. I can't tell the difference, to be honest with you. Awesome. That's great. So can you talk about what age uh, rhizotomy is typically performed, a selective dorsal rhizotomy, and then if, uh, uh, if that can be done for older individuals as well? So there's a little bit of debate about that. Uh, at, at our institution, we think that the ideal range is between four and eight years of age. We want them to have some level of maturity. We want their neurologic system to have some level of maturity so they don't have some reversal. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, but we will do children much older than eight. There are some institutions that will do them as an adult. If you have a child that uh, really fits into a good rhizotomy candidate, but they're adults, uh, they'll do procedures as well with the rhizotomy, and, and we have on occasions as well. 
Uh, so we will do it on adults, but most often it's younger kids because the outcomes are generally better when you have some time to adjust to your new neurologic system. It's a little bit harder when you're an adult. However, that doesn't mean you can't have great success as an adult as well. It's just a little more limited. Yeah. So can a GMFCS level be changed with intervention? Ah, there's a big debate about that too. Now, all of our kids, we tell them we don't change the level. It's going to stay the right. same. But I can tell you, you take the child that I saw you at the very beginning when we did the injections of phenol and botulinum toxin. Uh, she was a spastic diplegia and she was, I, I would categorize her as a GMFCS4 because uh, she couldn't really have, she had no functional walk. Well, one month later, she was walking with a walker everywhere she wanted to go. So she was a three. So that's very rare. But in general, you don't change the level. But if you get the just the right patients that's doing wonderfully well, yeah, you can change the level, but that's not very common. Okay. So for tight hip muscles, which are deeper, what would the first line of treatment be? Well, range of motion, obviously, but if you're looking for interventions, I use botulinum toxin. That's my first line. You don't inject phenol into that area. There's too many sensitive things around there that you can cauterize with phenol, so I don't do that. Uh, if uh, in some special cases, uh, in spinal cord injured patients uh, who are insensate, because I worry about dysesthesias, I will do a posterior approach where I'll go on the lumbar spine and uh, pick out nerves uh, in the dorsal area uh, and do phenol there, but that's pretty unusual. Most of the time, I'll use an anterior approach, and then I'll inject the, ili uh, the iliacus mainly, and, and, then, and then I'll thread myself, thread down, and get the, a little bit of the psoas. And occasionally, we'll use, I always use stimulation, and occasionally, we'll add in some uh, ultrasound as well. Some people use solely ultrasound to find the muscle. Then can contractures be reduced with treatment? Well, it depends on how stiff they are and how old the patient is. You have a young patient that has contractures and they have a lot of spasticity, you can reverse them to some extent if their joints are not scarred up. If their joints are scarred up, because ultimately what happens is you start to lose some range of motion at your joints and it will not reverse with just interventions of the muscle, even though the spastic muscles, which kind of created the situation. And so uh, you can reverse contractures, but if you have an adult who has a scarred up muscle that's been that way for a long time, it's going to be really, really hard to make a difference. Now, you can do surgeries to lengthen out the muscles, and so you can do that uh, from a surgical standpoint. You can do surgeries to reorient the, uh, the, uh, the joint itself, and we do that quite commonly at Gillette for fixed knee flexion contractures and hamstring contractures. We'll do a combination of both. Uh, and I'm not going to get into great details. Of there are certain techniques that you can utilize for that. So you can reverse contractures if they're not too old and the patients are fairly supple still and you reduce the spasticity. But you got to do a lot of stretching afterwards. It, it, the, the interventions alone are not, uh, you know, at least as far as the injections or uh, different sur neurosurgical procedures we do, that's not enough. You have to do a lot of stretching and splinting to, to get it, take advantage of uh, the reduction in spasticity. Sure. So there's a, a guest that's asking, as a physiatrist, do you perform the surgeries in conjunction with neurosurgery? Well, we are in, for the uh, rhizotomies, we are in there helping the monitoring process. And so we help with the localization of the rootlets and what rootlets and what level you are, because it gets confusing in there, because uh, there's a lot of different nerves. And so we help with that. Uh, there's a, usually a, a, a physio neurophysiologist that's there, and occasionally there's a physical therapist that's there as well, kind of depending on our setup. Uh, but we're in surgeries helping monitor and determine which rootlets are the worst and which ones should be cut and which ones we should leave behind. And so we do monitor in that regard. As far as the baclofen pump and things like that, we determine the dose, but we're not in there helping with the surgery. But we do determine uh, what dose to start them on and, uh, and then how to change the dosing, depending on if it's a changing of a baclofen pump or if it's a new baclofen pump. Sure. So another one question is, will a child outgrow hypotonia? No, you don't outgrow hypotonia. Now, hypotonia can get less over time because everybody gets stiff uh, over time, stiffer over time as you age. And so uh, some of that hypotonia will become a little bit stiffer and you get contractures, but you won't age out of hypotonia. Now, there is somewhat of a debate about spasticity and whether you outgrow spasticity or hypertonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's uh, there was some evidence that uh, it got less over time in our gate lab. And we did a a recent study looking at a rhizotomy uh, patients and comparing them to patients that didn't have rhizotomies, and it didn't bear out that they lost their spasticity as they got older 10 years after uh, they had some intervention. So, you know, someone in their 20s still had a lot of spasticity, so it doesn't go away. 
I, I will say that some of the tone changes over time, and you could interpret it as being somewhat less. I mean, the muscles may get stiffer, but the reflexes may be reduced to some extent. So you could argue the specificity is less, but the uh, consequences are, of them is more. But you don't generally outgrow them, but it can change to some extent over time as you age. So describe what procedures then that you would prescribe physical therapy after. Uh, I say, say that again. Um, what procedures do you prescribe physical therapy after? So do you do therapy okay. after a SDR? Yeah, oh yeah, all, all of them, hundred uh, yeah. percent. There's not a there's not a therapy we intervene because it, you know it, just getting rid of the it doesn't do the trick. You have to take advantage of that. Yeah. And if the kids don't receive therapies, they don't have the advantage. So if we were to just do a rhizotomy and let the kid uh, leave, and we've had kids that this has happened to, they've been lost to follow up. They didn't get their therapies. They didn't wear their braces. Didn't do all these other things. They come back and their tone is gone, so they don't have much spasticity. But their functional status is not improved. It, you really, really have to stay on top of the kid with therapy, and they should be getting therapy before you do any intervention, and they continue on afterwards. Now. We usually increase the intensity of therapy significantly after a certain treatment, and it may go back down to a certain level of therapy for a while. And then we have episodes of care where they take breaks and things yeah. like that. But it's imperative you have therapy. Yeah, great. Well, that's all the questions I have. Does anybody have anybody else have anything that they'd like to add? Oh, there's another one. Um, can children present with hypotonia and have a diagnosis of CP? Yes, they can. Now, uh, over 90% of the kids that have a diagnosis of CP will have hypertonia. And this gets maybe to the question that was a little bit before, can you outgrow hypotonia? You can if you don't have CP and it's just benign uh, congenital hypotonia of some sort and related to some benign syndrome that can evolve over time and then your tone does gradually increase. We get a lot of consults for kids that are less than a year or less than two years of age, you have some hypotonia, are a little slow to develop, and they have usually a, a, a host of other collection of issues. Uh, and I can give you a whole talk on that too. But uh, those kids, uh, if they don't have any significant neurologic problems, the basis for their hypotonia can get increased tone and strength over time. Then they tend to have some ligamentous laxity long-term and other kinds of issues like that, but they can get some uh, increase in uh, uh, the hypotonia. Now, of course, CP and hypotonia, Usually it's a genetic condition that we haven't diagnosed or you you with now with the, the ability to do much, much better genetic testing. A lot of those kids that have hypotonia and diagnosis CP. Now, remember, the diagnosis CP is a static lesion. And so if their condition is static and it affects their physical functioning and it occurred in an early developmental period and it affects their uh, some of their uh, brain function, then they can be considered CP. And it doesn't mean that they have to be hypertonic. So they could have some hypotonia, and then those children uh, could have the diagnosis of CP, but most often they probably have some syndrome. And if we haven't pulled it out from some of the genetic testing, then it's yeah. just one we haven't. Yeah. So the next question is, for how long can you uh, do Botox treatments? That's a good question. I mean, the, the short answer is as long as it's effective. So uh, botulinum toxins, they last... Uh, four to six months from a physiologic standpoint, well, it, it technically the last three months, and that's when you start getting sprouting again, starts to wear off, but the clinical effects can be longer, at least that's what I'm, I, I hope. There's very few patients I have that are every three months, and most of those have dystonia because in those patients, once it wears off, it, it, it that tone comes really comes roaring back. And so there's a number of patients I'll inject every three months. And some practitioners will use a kind of a lower dose and more frequently inject every three months because when it, that three month comes, it starts to wear off. Uh, but most often it'll be uh, every four to six months. Now, as a child ages and gets older, they find their rhythm and they find their new place and movement and tone and things like that. And so usually as you get older, you don't need to do it as much. So when you get to be the teenage years and things like that, we start backing off, if not before then. And uh, so usually you don't have to use it long term to that frequency. Now, with that being said, I do have a number of adult patients. I do injections on a regular basis, but they're fewer than the kids. The kids is almost universal as the adults. It's not. We usually get away from it uh, over time unless they're severely involved or they just respond remarkably well. And we continue to do that. And I showed you the uh, one case with a, a woman earlier uh, uh, regarding that. But uh, uh, yeah, so you can use it as long as it's effective long term. Most often you start to diminish uh, your use of it as a child uh, gets older. 
Now, I'll give you one example. I said, if you have a child that has mild spastic hemiplegic cerebral palsy, walks on their toes a little bit, and that child that we saw a little bit earlier uh, in, the, in the talk and that had a significant brain lesion but walked on his toes a little bit, uh, in those situations, you hammer really, really early. Uh, oftentimes, you don't need to do any injections. You just put them in a brace at night, and that's all you have to do. And I may have mentioned that earlier. But uh, a lot of times, you don't have to, in those milder kids, you don't have to do it long term at all. Talk a little bit about your thoughts on robotic gait training. Well, it's it's somewhat debated. I mean, you look at some studies when they do a really controlled trials between robotic training and, and traditional therapy. And if you do the same frequency and the same intensity uh, that uh, you see, the, uh, they're, they're really the same, uh, uh, the same effect. However, if you separate those two, and you take two cohorts, a group that does traditional therapy and a similar cohort uh, or group that does robotic therapy, and you monitor them, the robotic therapy tends to do better. And we don't understand quite, quite why that is. And we think that what happens is, is that robotic therapy in and of itself may not give you significant advantages over traditional therapy at the same intensity and the same frequency. However, the robotic therapy may be stimulating someone to do their homework more or you know, do their exercises yeah. more, or they may enjoy it so they participate more. And there's, there's some dynamic in a real world situation, robotic therapy seems to improve things, but in a controlled setting where everything is equal otherwise, it, it doesn't seem to have as much effect. And so we're really not quite sure how that all uh, is gonna pan out. So I think that robotic therapy is, is valuable because the kids love it and they participate in it. It's very expensive, however, uh, it, it, they, I get, we get requests all the time that summertime's coming. They want to go back to their body therapy because the parents know they're going to work their butt off in the summer yeah. if they're involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. So have you seen, um, ventral dorsal rhizotomy patients having return of some motor function, like in the polio patients that you talked about? Yes, mm -hmm. we have. So we don't want to knock it out completely. Now we do tell our, our families that if they're going to have a ventral dorsal rhizotomy and they do some functional, uh, have some functional skills in their lower extremities that they want to preserve, that you might lose it. Now, to be honest with you, I don't, we haven't lost it. So to give you an example, if, they're, if an adult child, it's very important for them to be able to do stamp pivot transfers and they use their tone to do that. And we do a ventral dorsal rhizotomy, wipe out all that tone. All of a sudden, uh, uh, a caregiver goes from being able to uh, have the, uh, the child or the adolescent or whatever age they are do a stamp pivot transfer. Uh, and use their tone to help them transfer to lifting them completely. And they may not be able to do that because they're too big. And so we tell them that you might lose some of that. But in most of our patients, we haven't seen them lose that. They, they've maintained at least enough to do that previous activity. But it is a, it is a risk. And so uh, we, uh, we uh, worry about losing too much of that strength. However, it almost always some of it returns. And when, they, when you first see them, it gets a little bit alarming because if you have a child that you want to have a little bit of tone and a little bit of strength, when they first have that ventral dorsal rhizotomy, there's nothing there. They can't move their leg. They're super right. hypotonic and super weak. And you get really concerned. you got to wait a full year for some of that to return. And you've got to really cut that 90% to, to be assured that you're not going to get significant return because if you cut that 60 to 70% of the ventral rootlets, there's a percentage of, not all of them, but there's a percentage of the patients that are going to get a significant return in their tone uh, that's going to continue to be problematic. And it's really hard to go back in there and start cutting more again. Yeah, right. So this question, next question is from a parent, it looks like. Um, she says, my 31-year-old son had an SDR at age four. Um, he has progressive tightening as he ages and gains weight despite his activity level and exercise routine. Is there another prescribed treatment for his tightening? He's had Botox in the forearm and hand, but his right forearm is a particular concern and his wrist is forward bending at all times. So with that description, without seeing him, it sounds like he has some level of dystonia. So he's got a little bit more involvement than simple spasticity. And that would be most common with most of the kids we have with cerebral palsy. Uh, and so uh, as he's gotten older, the dystonia tends to, to get a little bit worse. And some of that tone tends to get a little bit worse. And also, we don't want to wipe out all the tone with a rhizotomy because then you end up with weak, floppy muscles. So uh, he's probably got some of that that's kind of reeled itself in. He's gotten stiffer because he's 31. He's gotten a little stiffer over time, which normally happens with anybody as they age, and particularly someone with cerebral palsy. So in that 
in that particular patient, if you're looking for some additional interventions and you already had medications and therapies and activity level, which is the most important thing you can do is just walk, 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 or stretch, 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 uh, you could consider a baclofen pump. So baclofen pump, and we've done that quite often, where as a child that had a rhizotomy gets a little bit older and had a little bit more tone to begin with uh, and starts to have more difficulties, we do uh, we do uh, implant a baclofen pump, and we have some success with that, and it seems to work out. I wouldn't do, necessarily do a ventral dorsal rhizotomy unless you really didn't care if all of those muscles were uh, knocked out, uh, but a baclofen pump might be a nice option. Okay, next one is, can the causes of hypotonia range from chromosomal abnormalities to a brain injury, which can include Down syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome? So Prader-Willi and Down syndrome, uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's a, and that's a chromosomal abnormality. So yes, and the yeah. chromosome, that's most commonly when you see hypotonia. Now, I presented a case in which someone had hypotonia and ataxia, and they had a cerebellar lesion. So they had uh, problems with the cerebellum. So if you have an isolated problem in your cerebellum and you avoid the cortex and some of the deeper uh, uh, white matter uh, issues in the brain and it's isolated to the cerebellum, they will be hypotonic. And so in patients that have uh, hypotonic cerebral palsy and it's due to some type of brain lesion that's not chromosomally related, oftentimes it will be cerebellum in origin. And so uh, so yes, you can get that uh, with some cerebellar issues as well as uh, hypoton uh, from chromosomal abnormalities. Okay, you're going fast on these. You're good. <laughs> I've got three or four more of those. Oh, but okay. <laughs> okay. Can you do an SDR after ITB? Yes, and we've done that before. We had I, I had we had a set of twins that uh, one of them was ambulatory and the uh, other one was non-ambulatory and they both had pumps and they just didn't do very well. And so the kid that was ambulatory with a walker and he had limited walking, uh, we decided that, uh, and he also had some exacerbation of seizure activity. We decided that we do a, uh, a rhizotomy. So we did a rhizotomy on him and he did wonderfully well. He can still walk and he does well, really well. And he did so well that his twin, who was non-ambulatory, the parents wanted to do a uh, rhizotomy as well for that child, and we did. And even though they're non-ambulatory, they did re uh, remarkably well as well. And so, yeah, you can. And we've had uh, uh, you know, many other examples where we've done that. We take out the pump and do the rhizotomy. That, that child I saw you or the adult now who's in college, that uh, uh, with the, they had the really good outcomes from the uh, phenol blocks and the botulinum toxin injections, and we did the back of the pump. And I wish we had done a rhizotomy when she was younger. You could consider doing a rhizotomy with her, but boy, it's taking a chance, and I don't, we're, none of us are brave enough to do that. But uh, if you could take it back, I would do a rhizotomy to see what happens, because I think it ultimately uh, would uh, be better for her. And so the follow-up question to that one is, can you do an uh, SDR after multiple lower extremity orthopedic surgeries, such as tenotomies? Yeah, you can, but you you be careful. So we, we're careful with that. So uh, and our patients that we know are likely to be a rhizotomy candidate and they're going to do some orthopedic surgeries, we ask that they don't cut the adductor longest tendon. We don't do the adductor release because they tend to be super weak in their hips and it takes a while to recover from that. And so we don't like a lot of tenotomies afterwards. And the, the surgical procedures, the common ones, with which we don't do, the percutaneous tenotomies that are done in a couple of centers in, in the United States uh, that are fairly common. If you were to do a rhizotomy after that, your outcomes are not quite as good. Uh, because those muscles are too weak and there's not enough there to to rely on. Uh, and so uh, you can, we just are very careful about it. We would rather do the bony work and leave the uh, muscle tendons alone unless you really had to cut something. Uh, but to, to do it judiciously and not to do it too much and then uh, uh, and then do the rhizotomy afterwards. Uh, you can do a rhizotomy after a lot of that stuff. You just, you just have to be careful and know that your outcomes may be a, a little bit less. It may be the most wonderful thing in the world, the combination of the two, but you're, uh, but you have a, a higher degree of uncertainty uh, if they've had a lot of tenotomies. There's a couple questions here about um, what are your thoughts on serial casting? I love serial casting. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, sometimes they don't tolerate serial casting unless you reduce the spasticity. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll do a combination of injections with the serial casting. Sometimes if they have a uh, fixed joint contracture, the serial casting doesn't do much because serial casting does not help a fixed joint, but it does stretch out a muscle. 
uh, you got to keep in mind that serial casting without reducing the spasticity will stretch the tendon and won't stretch the muscle very much. So you'll get a longer uh, tendon muscle length, but you won't necessarily get a longer muscle, but you'll get a longer tendon. And so um, it, 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 it's not quite as advantageous as if, if you had a longer muscle. Uh, so I do serial casting quite a bit, uh, and I incorporate it in the upper extremities as well as the lower extremities. And it works quite well as long as the muscle is supple enough to tolerate it. Can you tell us what uh, is benign congenital hypotonia? Uh, <laughs> well, it's kind of a generic term. Uh, it just means just kind of what it sounds like. It means that uh, you have a child that is born that has some uh, low muscle tone. They don't have some other uh, neurologic condition or associated with it. And it's benign because they eventually uh, continue to develop and grow and do quite well from a functional standpoint. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of an umbrella term for a lot of those things that we do see. And it's basically a term for something we don't really fully understand. It's better to have a very, very formal diagnosis and that just to be a component of it. OK, so here's one from a parent again. This is a long question, so I'll just read it. I'm a okay. mother of a young lady that's 20 years old with CP hypertone in lower extremities. She also has epilepsy quadriplegic G-tube dependent, is on phenobarbital and tomip, topamet, I don't know, top topamet, it's easier to say. Yeah, 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 along with baclofen 10 milligrams. When she takes baclofen, it, may, it seems to cancel seizure meds, so at this point, I'm not sure if I should continue with baclofen, even though I was told to give time to adjust to her body so we can try it for a month but I've decided to stop back with them for the meantime. Okay. So what's, there's a, is there a specific question there? Uh, I mean, I can make comments on what she said, but. Um, oh, wait, 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 there's more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a long question. Um, Page two. She has general tonic clonic seizures and clusters. So she's seizure activity is hard to get stable. Had you heard or had a patient with such problems in your career? all the time. That's a very, very common scenario. Uh, you know, the, the kids that we talked about uh, that uh, we converted from an uh, interstitial back lymph pump to a residomy was because of their, uh, one of the reasons was because of their seizure activity. One is because the pump wasn't working as well, but they were having seizure exacerbations. And so back lymph is not supposed to increase your seizures, but it does in some kids. It just, it, it does. And uh, a lot of these patients can be very, very difficult to manage. Uh, and uh, and then when you try to manage them, then their uh, their siege activity increases and it can be very difficult to control. Uh, so it's tough. It's a quandary and you just mix and match uh, uh, some of the things and some of the interventions. I, I think it, in that particular scenario, if tone is the issue, I would consider one of the one and done uh, surgical procedures. If baclofen orally is uh, causing some seizure problems, you are at risk that intrathecal baclofen would. Uh, but you may consider a rhizotomy or a, uh, uh, a ventral dorsal rhizotomy or one of those procedures that can significantly reduce their tone and ease some of the burden of the medications. Uh, and you hopefully will get better control of the seizure activity without, uh, uh, you know, uh, just making more difficulties for yourself because of all the other medications you're using for the tone. So there's a question about uh, low income families without health insurance and they're seeing signs of uh, motor delays in their children. Uh, where should they turn for help? Well, most, most states uh, will have a system that's in place uh, that if you don't have insurance covered uh, that uh, you can uh, apply and retroactively uh, cover uh, a lot of the cost. Once your application is in for coverage, let's say uh, you're low income and you qualify for Medicaid, uh, then uh, you can start the process of getting uh, evaluated. Because if you have a small child and you have some concerns, you don't want to wait till you, six months later when you get approval. Uh, and so most of, most certain states, once the application is in, uh, and you have to check with each individual state to make sure the rules are the same. But uh, once the application has been filed, then you can immediately get uh, uh, evaluations, and then whatever bills that are generated will retroactively be paid by Medicaid. Uh, and in the state of Minnesota, it's retroactively paid three months. So if you generate a bill uh, uh, three months prior to your application, it will go back and, and pay for the three months previous to that. 
Uh, and then there's also uh, 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 institutions that will uh, provide uh, and have a mechanism for free care. There are some, uh, depending on the state, but there are some patients that are low income that can't, that don't have insurance, but don't have a low enough income uh, to qualify for Medicaid. And that's kind of that donut where they're missed. Uh, Obamacare has tried to cover some of that and, and help, but it depends on if your individual state will has bought into all of that. Uh, uh, but usually you can find a facility that will uh, work something out with you so that you don't have to uh, basically take out uh, a mortgage on your house or sell your car to, to get the care that yeah. your child needs. Yeah. So then the last question I see here is, can you tell us a little bit about the program that took you to Jamaica? Well, we started it ourselves. And so that, start, that started with us. Uh, and uh, we had a group of dignitaries from Jamaica that were visiting the United States. And uh, their host just happened to live in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And it was the, the dean of the medical school uh, of Jamaica, the University of West Indies. Uh, it was uh, uh, the U, uh, U.S. ambassador or the Jamaican ambassador to the U.S. Uh, and then uh, they had a, a few other uh, dignitaries as well. Uh, the minister of health came along. And so uh, I happened to be walking in the hall as they're touring the hospital and uh, the person giving the tours uh, to them asked if I would mind talking to them. And I sat down and talked to them. And I said, you know, and I sat down and talked to them for about an hour. And I said, I've done some international work. If you're ever interested in uh, me helping out, just let me know. And they hooked me up with a physician here, Paula Dawson, who's a pediatric, who's an adult physiatrist, who's learned to do pediatrics. And uh, it kind of evolved from there. We've been doing it for 13 years, come down three times a year. We do injections and uh, equipment and uh, do rhizotomies. And uh, it's it's been wonderfully satisfying and I think wonderfully successful too. It's been, it's, if, if people, if you haven't been involved in some of these international programs, I would encourage anybody and you can be anybody uh, in health. There's, there's always something that you can help with. Uh, and it's, it's, it really is rewarding. It's one of my favorite things to do in life. Thank you, Dr. Gormley. There's one last statement that says in it, er, in some States, early intervention services are free. So that's just a, a, a um, note from one of the uh, participants. Yep, so, yeah. okay. yep, some are better notes. Okay, I will let James take over from here. I think he's next. Thanks, Mary Beth. Thanks, uh, Thanks Dr. Slide. Gormley, appreciate your help. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gormley. Um, we have a slide coming up, and as you can see on the slide, we have information about the next event that is coming, uh, the next webinar. It will be uh, with Dr. Michael Kruer uh, from Phoenix Children's. Uh, that's on September the 29th, uh, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern time is the start time. Uh, Dr. Kruer also happens to be the co-chair of the UCP uh, Research Committee, along with Valerie Pericini. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Gormley is on that research committee as well. So thank him for doing that. Uh, we really appreciate all your feedback. So if you'll see in the chat window, the chat box, we have a link there uh, where you can send feedback to us. Uh, we've been doing this for about a year now. This is uh, basically our one year anniversary of these events. And uh, we want to be doing it for many years to come, uh, but we would love your feedback on what you think of the presentations and um, how useful they are to you, uh, if there's someone that you would like to see present at some point in the future, et cetera, just to, just send your ideas along. Um, on behalf of United Cerebral Palsy uh, and the Research Committee and Gillette Children's, uh, UCB of Minnesota and UCP of Central Arizona, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, and please uh, look to your email for notices about the next webinar. Those will be coming to you uh, in relatively short order. Uh, oh, last thing, if you want to see any of the past um, presentations, uh, you can go to ucp.org uh, and look under the research tab. There's a list there, professional uh, learning series webinars. You can also go to the UCP YouTube channel. Uh, and I believe um, Gillette also posts um, uh, videos as well. But if you have any uh, issues at all, feel free to email us and we can uh, certainly point you in the direction of, um, of this uh, webinar uh, recording and also any that we have had previously. Thank you so much for attending, uh, and thank you everyone on the team for making this happen today. James, can I make one comment? Is that okay? Of course. Uh, yeah, so Michael Kruer, who's given the next uh, uh, presentation, 
uh, he is a world's expert in genetic conditions that uh, are diagnosed as cerebral palsy. Uh, and a lot of the questions I got today uh, had to deal with hypotonia uh, and uh, ch children that have some uh, other uh, similar kind of conditions. Uh, he is the person to ask regarding those questions. He can give you much more details and insights than I can. Uh, and so if you have those, uh, still have those questions, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to tune in for uh, Dr. Kruer's talk because he'll be able to answer those questions much better than me. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, evening, afternoon.